Are we there? <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship on Easter. What a special Sunday to be here. I sure appreciate your coming. You may be a first timer here or you may be someone who doesn't come too often. And I want you to know that the well is a welcoming place. I love this congregation and I'm so proud of it for so many reasons, but we welcome everyone regardless of your background, regardless of your orientation, regardless of your religion, regardless of whether you believe or whether you don't, you are welcome here and we give thanks for that. So thank you for being here to make our Easter Sunday even more special. Um, usually I do announcements now, I'll kind of breeze through these today. The Well is a very active congregation. We have Wednesday night dinners, we have pickleball, we have choirs, we have Bible studies, we have groups talking about social issues, and I won't go through them all today, but it's a great place to be. And if you want to come back and know more about it, we'd love to tell you. We had a good Easter egg hunt. Did the adults all find the eggs? <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> we appreciate your being here again. So, where are we? Gosh. Call to worship. Please rise as you're able for our call to worship. At early dawn, they came, expecting death, but instead they experienced new life. New life. At early dawn, the mystery of hope is reborn, death denied. We have kept vigil with Jesus. So now we celebrate the good news. Christ is risen. Do that one one more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Praise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye hymns and Christ has opened paradise. 
has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. Thanks for joining us this morning. I do want to say before our next song, just uh, it's it's Easter, which is fantastic. It's also uh, National Day of Transgender Day of Visibility. So con uh, congratulations to those of you that have uh, taken that courageous step to share that that's who you truly are, and we celebrate you today. <laughs> In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in yourself, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Oh, no. 
This child can face uncertain days because Christ lives, because He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is gone. seated I'm gonna invite the kids to come on come on up. up kids it's Easter Sunday but we're gonna do it different today I need you to sit on the floor here okay okay sometimes we sit on the step but we're sitting on the floor today oh I'm so glad you're here for Easter it's a special day a lot of fun how many of you got something like this today an Easter basket oh you did what did you have in your basket? A lot of candy, all right. A chocolate bunny, that sounds good, you too. Anybody else? What would you get? A sticker book, a coloring book. And two I can't remember, I like those. <laughs> there we go. Uh, last service, somebody got socks. 
Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Easter socks. <laughs> you got socks? There you go. You got socks too? Did you get? You didn't get socks. You got an Easter bunny. All right. So I wanted to go through your basket with you, and let's talk about what these things mean. Okay. Who got a little peep? A little marshmallow peep. These are very special. You know what they have to do with Easter? Marshmallows. Nothing. <laughs> What if it's a duck dipped in chocolate? Ooh, yum. I do too, yeah. What does it have to do with Easter? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I know. Little chicks peeps. Yeah. What does it have to do with Easter? Nothing. <laughs> Reese's Pieces. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Wait a second. This is a big one. What if you have a chocolate bunny? Now, this one is dark chocolate, and guess what it has to do with Easter? Nothing, Nothing but I'm not throwing it. <laughs> so, how many people got an egg today, or eggs in their basket? Now, this is closer to the meaning of Easter, because eggs are like new life, right? New life comes from eggs, and that's really exciting. I really like getting eggs in my Easter basket, but you know what I don't like? I don't like it when I have to peel the shell off them. Isn't that kind of a pain? You guys ever do that? I'm going to show you a trick. I'm going to show you a way to take the shell off one second and you're done. Okay? You just tap it on your forehead. Watch. It works perfectly. Ready? That almost never happens. This one, I'll show you how it works. Ready? This one will be good. <laughs> Don't run away. <laughs> one, two. Is this one going to work? I don't know. What do you think? How many think it's going to work? <laughs> I love scaring kids during children's message. All right. We'll see. One, two. <laughs> Those are real eggs. <laughs> Don't run away, it's safe. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Come have a seat. <laughs> All right. Easter is not about eggs. It's not about chocolate. It's not about bunnies. It's about Jesus. Very good. Now, I promised the congregation that I would explain why an Easter bunny brings eggs. Okay? And I forgot at the first service. So who's going to remind me during the sermon? Kelly, you remind me if I forget. <laughs> Easter Bunny. Okay. So, Easter is about Jesus because Jesus died on the cross. And then he, no, he died on Friday. But on Sunday morning, he raised up from the dead. That had never happened before. Then he was alive again. And it was a promise from God that life is stronger than death and that nothing can stop God, even death. And so we take a lot of... Thanks. We take a lot of joy in that and we give thanks because it's the truth. Life is stronger than death and God will always be in your side. Let's pray. Lord God, bless these young people here. Watch over them and keep them safe. Protect them from all harm. Help them to go forth in Easter joy. Help them to go forth knowing that Jesus is in their hearts and that you have promised them a life that lasts forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may go back to your seats. <laughs> I just wanted you to get the whole experience, you know? <laughs>
God of the victory of life over death, on this glorious Easter Sunday, we rejoice in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Just as the women encountered the empty tomb and the angelic message of a new life, we too encounter the living Christ in our hearts and lives. As we come to present our tithes and offerings, may they be an affirmation of our search for the risen Christ, the one who challenges us to see beyond our own expectations. Bless our giving and help us discover the transformative power of the living Jesus in our lives. In the holy name of our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary Pouring like a sky of falling stars. Blessed are the wounded ones in mourning, brave enough to show the Lord their scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. Blessed are the ones who are in kindness. Even in the face of great abuse. Blessed are the deeds that go unnoticed, serving with unguarded gratitude. Blessed are the ones who fight for justice, long for the coming day of peace. Blessed is the soul that thirsts for righteousness, welcoming the last the lost the least the kingdom is yours the kingdom is yours hold on a little more this is not the end hope is in the Lord keep your eyes on Blessed is the faith of those who persevere. Though they'll fall, they'll never know defeat. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on him. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on
We're so blessed to be together in Easter. Family and friends coming together. Longtime members, visitors, being in the same service, worshiping the same Lord, asking for the same prayers, that God would bless us, that God would pour out a spirit upon us, that shower over us and transform us. So be with me today as we join in prayer. Lord God, I give you thanks for this beautiful morning and the many people who've gathered here. Bless this time, enrich our lives from it, inspire us. And Lord, we pray for this church and for churches all around the world that celebrate Easter in so many different ways and so many different traditions. We pray, Lord, that each one would be a blessing to, to whoever's there worshiping with them. Lord, in your mercy, and yet, Lord, we live in a very troubled world that has violence, terrorism, hatred, prejudice, racism. Lord, help us. Hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, droughts. Lord, there's so many terrible things we want to pray about. We lift up this morning the people of Palestine and Israel, Ukraine and Russia, Yemen and Haiti, Bring peace to these warring people. Bring recovery so that they can put their lives back together again. Help them heal. Help them get past these things. Lord, in your mercy. If you have a prayer request, I'll come around with the microphone. I'd just like to give thanks for a very successful complex oral surgery that I had earlier this week and just prayers that they find out that the mass they removed is not cancerous. We join you in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. And thank you for all your prayers for my mom. She's doing okay, hanging in there. Keep going to those doctor appointments, you know, three, four times a week. Um, but she's hanging in there, so we're having some good family time. And also, I'll let Ed introduce our family. <laughs> Let's pray for Grandma Jean. Lord, in your mercy, I'll come back to you guys. I give thanks to my friends over here. Uh, Cork grew up in Rosemount. We just had his mom's service not too long ago at this church. A lot of you helped. We appreciate that. Cork and I have been having coffee every morning for over 25 years on Saturdays. 25 years. You think he'd remember his wallet one time. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I give thanks. And the people of God say... Thanks be to God. And I'll give thanks. My family's here. And I just can't tell you how blessed I am. I'm one of the lucky ones. So many good things in my life to give thanks for. So many good things to rejoice in. And I know everybody's not this lucky. I know some of you struggle. Some of you don't have family. Some of you are alienated from friends. And I understand that. And I appreciate it. But I'm going to give thanks for what I do have. We have two wonderful, amazing daughters who are strong and independent to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> they each have children of their own now. So Rosie and I are blessed with four grandchildren. I can't tell you how many years we waited for that to happen, but now that it's happened, we give thanks. And the people of God say, and so now we pray for those who are near and dear to us, who we have concerns about silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, and hear us now as we pray, say the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray at all times, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Bible passage for today represents to this congregation who have been with me for a while through the series as we've gone through the whole Gospel of Mark just about from Jesus' baptism, his teachings, his miracles, his challenges, his road to Jerusalem, bringing him to this. And as we remember today, the first passage begins here, when the Sabbath was over. So I want to just back up for a second. What day of the week is Sabbath for Jewish people? Saturday. When does it begin? Saturday sun, Friday, Friday sundown till Saturday sundown. When was Jesus crucified? Friday afternoon, right? And there wasn't time to give him a proper funeral. Luckily, they were able to get him to a tomb, but they didn't get to finish. So then it's Sabbath, and they can't do anything all day Saturday. Saturday night, the sun goes down. Now they can do it. Why didn't they do it Saturday night? Because it's dark, they don't have lights, and it's a cemetery. Who wants to do that, right? So they go as soon as they can Sunday morning. And that decision to go on Sunday, that, that one moment there, is the reason we're here on a Sunday. That's the reason the church worships on Sunday, because they did this on a Sunday. They saw the resurrection on Sunday. It's been sacred ever since. So when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. They didn't really have a plan. I wonder what would happen if it hadn't been rolled away, right? But they're going on faith, and they get there, and the stone has been rolled away. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. Of course they are. Your friend has died, been put hastily in this tomb Friday afternoon. You're here Sunday morning to finish anointing him. He's not there. The, tomb, the stone is rolled away, and there's this stranger, a man dressed in white. What are they going to think? What have you done? Where's Jesus? What's going on? But he said to them, don't be, aff- don't be alarmed. Now, this is a clue to me that he's an angel. It says in Matthew and Luke that he is an angel, but let's just have Mark for a second. Throughout the scriptures, angels appear to people in the Old and the New Testament. And I just love the fact that whenever they appear, they almost always, almost every single time, start with the same thing. Don't be afraid. And I have this feeling that they need to say that because if suddenly you were somewhere and you weren't expecting something and suddenly an angel just showed up in your kitchen or in your car or wherever, you might freak out. Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed, it says here. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. There's the beginning of the good news. He isn't here. Go look at the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter. Now, wait a minute. i got to stop there. There are 12 disciples. Whenever they're mentioned, Peter's almost always, maybe always, is the first one they mention. So go tell the disciples that should include Peter. But here it says, especially Peter. Why? Because on Thursday night, when Jesus was arrested and taken off to be tried, he told Peter, he says, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter swears on his life, I would never do that to you. I'm by you forever. Of course, he follows Jesus to where he's being tried People recognize him. They say, you're one of him. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, we can tell. You talk with an accent like you're from Galilee. Oh, I don't know the man. He goes through this three times saying, I don't know the man. I'm not the guy you're looking for. I'm not him. 
He's too afraid to admit he knows them. So go and tell the disciples, especially Peter, because who knows what Peter's doing at this point? He's probably feeling pretty bad about himself. Other translations say, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Go and tell the disciples, including Peter, and my favorite, go and tell the disciples, even Peter. (laughs) (laughs) So Peter sort of remembered at this moment as the guy that's on the outs. Go and tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Now, we've gone through the maps here before. Jerusalem's in the south. Galilee is in the north. The Sea of Galilee, the big lake up there. That's where Peter and John and James and Jesus lived in a town called Capernaum. I'll come back to Capernaum in a minute. Go and tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he's going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. So, Here's the final verse of Mark's gospel. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, that doesn't work. That's a terrible place to end the gospel. For years, I thought that Mark had kind of goofed it up. Surely he didn't mean that. There must be a section we don't know about. If you open your Bibles and look at the 16th chapter of Mark, there's always a space at this verse, and it says an alternate ending. And people who agree with that's the wrong way to end a gospel, hundreds of years later, added 12 more verses. People who can read first century Greek and are smarter than I am tell us that that's Greek is completely different than what Mark's written in. The theology is different, the, the grammar is different, everything's different about it. It's an add-on. Mark ended his gospel abruptly with no good news. I'll come back to that. Grace to you and peace from God who is our Father, our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Making sense of Easter is a challenge for Christians. What does it mean to say we believe in life after death? What does it mean to say we believe that Jesus was dead and he's been resurrected? What does that mean for us today. Now, I know that some of you are here because you're always here. I know that some of you are here because you read these scriptures all the time, you pray about them, and they're a part of your life, and that's great. I know some of you are visitors, and I know a few of you are here only because your family made you come. Could you raise your hand so we could... (laughs) I get it. I'm here, you know, I got to go, the family thing, we're going to get a ham afterwards, whatever. But here's what I want you to understand about the church that people don't understand. People think, I don't want to be a part of that church. They don't like gay people. That's not true. We do. I don't want to be a part of that church. They're old-fashioned. It's not true. I don't want to be a part of church. They're hypocrites. That's true. People tell me, I don't want to go to the church. It's full of hypocrites. I say, no, it's not. There's room for one more. Come on in. (laughs) (laughs) But people, and I respect this, when I get to talk to them, I have doubts, Pastor Ed. I don't believe all those things I was told. I can't believe in all those miracles. I can't believe in a virgin birth, changing water to wine, walking on water, whatever miracle it is you have trouble with. Guess what? I don't believe them all either. I don't know anybody that believes all of them. That's okay. Because when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he never said the most important thing from here on out is for you to believe all these good things. And if you don't believe, you're not good Christians. He never says that. When they tell him, ask him, what's the most important thing to learn? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. And then he says, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Not believe this or believe that or trust this doctrine or be, be uh, you know, indoctrinated. The good news of Jesus Christ is about loving other people and loving the Lord. If you've got questions, if you've got doubts, that's okay. We all do. That's what church is about. You're always welcome here and in other churches. Just try to be that loving person that the Lord has called you to be. Now, my congregation can tell you that I kind of get into history and archaeology because there's many examples of where it sort of documents what the Gospels tell us as being true. When we started Mark's Gospel with Jesus' baptism, we looked at the Jordan River where he's baptized. John the Baptist was there. We looked, talked about the approximate reason, 
region. And people still go to that spot today to be baptized. It's a beautiful place. We don't know what happened there exactly. But then when Jesus is in Capernaum, which is a small town on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's not a sea. Jews call it a lake. Muslims call it a lake. Christians call it a sea. I don't know why. It's a good-sized lake, about Mille Lacs. There's a town on the west side that, luckily for us, was destroyed in about the year 250. Why is that lucky? Not all of it got rebuilt. There's parts of Capernaum that go back to the time of Jesus. There's one broken-down house there that Christians in the 300s, 1,700 years ago, said that was Peter's house. We don't know if it was, but it's kind of cool. Maybe it was. There's a synagogue there, and you can see the foundation still of where Jesus taught. That's cool. About 20 years ago, when there was a drought and the lake receded, they found a boat just off the shore, a fishing boat that, guess what, was about 2,000 years old. Now they call it the Jesus boat, and you've got to pay a lot of money to go in and see it, but it's, it's there. It's cool. <laughs> it tells us how big the boat was, what it was like when we read these stories. It's documentation. Then we went across the sea to the, to the side of, well, I won't go into all that now, but we talked about how the scriptures in Mark referenced the Roman legion that was there at the time, the 12th legion. And then we found evidence of the 12th legion all over Israel. I got excited by that. Then we get to the last week. Jesus was crucified. Who tried him? Who declared him guilty? What was his name? Pontius, Pontius Pilate. Archaeologists have found a stone in Caesarea where Pilate lived that says, on the stone, Pilate. We have a stone from the time of Pilate that still exists. People tell me these stories didn't happen. They're all made up. It's not true for a lot of reasons. But part of this is the documentation that I just love. So I had to do this with the with the crucifixion and resurrection today. Let's go to the first slide. About the year 320-something, Constantine the Great, the Roman emperor, the most powerful man in the world, was baptized. The first emperor to be baptized. And when the emperor, your boss is boss is boss, is baptized, guess what everybody else does? The whole nation gets baptized almost at once. Now they want to be on the inn, Right? So some, soon it becomes a state religion. Constantine's mother, I believe her name was Helena. Yep, Helena. Wanted to go to Israel, to Palestine, to see where Jesus had been. She wanted to find sacred relics. So she goes to Israel, and here's the mother to the most important, powerful man in the world. And she says things like, can you show me where Jesus was born? That was 300 years ago. They could have said, what do you expect us to know 300 years ago? You don't say that to that woman, right? <laughs> She's too powerful. You go over here and go, she was born right here. <laughs> wow. Build a church here in Bethlehem. There is a church to this day that's 1,700 years old that she ordered built. And you can go inside and you can see the spot where Jesus was born. And I don't believe it. <laughs> I think they were trying to say the right thing. I don't know that Jesus was born in that spot. But here's what I know. For 1,700 years, Christians of good faith have come to that spot and prayed. That makes it holy to me. That's historic. That's, that's important. So she did this on Mount Sinai. She did this in other places. But then most importantly, she wanted to see where was Jesus crucified? Where was he buried? Where was he resurrected? And they showed her a spot in Jerusalem, and there was a Roman temple on top of it. And she says, tear down that temple and build a church. And the story goes that as they were digging out the foundation of the church, they found three wooden crosses. What a coincidence, right? Because <laughs> there were three crosses in the story. Which one's the real one? They brought in a blind person who touches the first cross, nothing happened. Touches the second cross, nothing happened. Touches the third cross, and he can see. That's the true cross. Now, if you believe that, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> but she did take that cross back to Rome with her. That became the true cross. 
in Martin Luther, you jump ahead to the 1500s in his lifetime, he said, there's so many pieces of the true cross in Europe today, you could build a fleet of ships with them. <laughs> he also said, there were 12 disciples, and he said, 14 of them were buried in Germany alone. <laughs> you want to go see where John the Baptist's head is? He was beheaded. Well, they saved his head, of course. It's in three different places. <laughs> Over time, we've lost what these things are true, which ones are real. It's kind of hard to sort it all out. But I get excited by this. Inside the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is this structure. Go back one. This, is, this structure was built, I think, in the 1800s around the slab of stone where they said Jesus was laid. So you can still go in there to this day. It's gold, it's incense, it's candles, it's velvet. It's, in my opinion, kind of gross. Not my style. And he was crucified on a hill, and I think the next one, so on the second floor of the church, they showed her where Jesus had been crucified. Next slide. That's the spot where Jesus was crucified, according to these people. And so, of course, they built the church there. They've got a, 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 an altar there and a place to worship there. Christians to this day still go there to worship. They've got a spot, the exact spot where Jesus was crucified. They put up a cross, the next one. That's supposed to be the spot. We don't know. I don't know. It's historic. I'm fascinated by that. Next. This is a great tradition during Holy Week. I think this is the Ethiopian churches gather and they all light candles around that structure. Doesn't it look cool? I want to get invited to that. If anybody has tickets, let me know. I, I just love to go. <laughs> I'm sure it's hard to get in. Next. Oh, this is fun. Um, how many of you think the church is petty? <laughs> how many of you are tired of the church being just hung up on little details? Doesn't happen, never. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is just outside the front door of the church. You see there's a ladder on the second floor there. In the 1700s, a group of workmen went up there to do some kind of work, and they had the ladder with them, and they forgot to take it with them when they left. So the next day, this group went up and tried to take it down. It started a commotion. You can't take that ladder down. You don't have the authority. We have the authority to decide when we take it down. No, you don't. We have the authority. It's still there. <laughs> They can't decide who has the authority to take the ladder down. The Pope has even gotten involved. He's written some kind of statement about this ladder. And I just look at that when, I, when I'm there in Jerusalem. I look at that ladder and I go, the church is sometimes just too petty. We've got to get past that. We've got to get to the, true, the good news. Now, if you don't like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and who does? There's another choice. In the 1700s, next slide, there was an archaeologist in Jerusalem looked out the window to his hotel, and he saw this hillside, and he said, you know, that hill kind of looks like a skull. Now, that's relevant because Jesus is crucified on Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And he said, maybe that hill's important. So over the next hundred years, they started excavating around it and digging around, and they found this. This is a tomb. This is the tomb, and you go into the right, as it says in the scriptures. This is the tomb that has a slot for a very large stone in front of it. Some of these things kind of fit. They said, this is the tomb where Jesus was buried. This is the spot where he was resurrected. So when you go to Israel to this day, you can worship at either side, at the Holy Sepulchre or this one. I, I kind of like this one because it's beautiful and gardens and all those good things. And they've done a nice job with the history on it. Next this is a sample of the stones they rolled in front of the tombs. This isn't the stone. It's not big enough for that slot. But you've got to get the idea how hard that would be to move, right? And next. Oh, yeah. If that's Jesus' tomb, we don't know for sure. But if it is, this is probably where he was crucified, in the parking lot. <laughs> I've caught buses there before. It's a parking lot filled with buses. And a part of me kind of likes that. Not gold and incense and velvet and, and, you know, prayers and priests standing around it, but an everyday space where people come and people go and where Jesus died for us. That makes a lot more sense to me. All right.
I have so many more things to say. How much time do I have? Hours? Okay, good. <laughs> I promised last week, and I, I promised the first service I would talk about the Easter bunny. Why does a bunny rabbit bring eggs? Okay. This goes back about 1,500 years to Germany and England, and there was an April festival celebrating spring. And the goddess of spring was the goddess of fertility. And her name was based on the word east, and it's estre or oestre or something pronounced like that. That's where we get the word Easter from, the pronunciation of her name. And there's two versions of the story. In one version, she's the goddess of the spring. And one year, there's a late spring, and she comes along, and she finds a poor bird who's freezing. Because spring is late. And she turns them into a bunny rabbit. Because bunny rabbits can stay warm in the cold. But the bunny rabbit's still a bird. So guess what the bunny rabbit hatches? Eggs. That's where they come from. There's a second version where she is the bird. She gets captured. She turns herself into a bunny rabbit so they won't recognize her. But then she starts laying eggs and they figure it out. <laughs> None of these stories have anything to do with Jesus. But it's fascinating how we got there. And we turned it into an entire industry. Bunny rabbits. Chocolate. Eggs. It's a tradition that doesn't make a lot of sense, but traditions don't have to. All right, my grandson's asking to go, so I'll speed this part up. <laughs> uh, I'm also very much into art, and I'll show you a few paintings that, are, that make a lot to me. This is obviously a painting of the crucifixion, and if you look at that Jesus, ask yourself this question, is that man suffering? He's not, is he? Is that man in control? He is. This is Jesus who's God. You can't hurt me. That's the theology of this painting. And then see at the bottom of the cross, there's a skull and crossbones. We zoom in on that. When you see that in an old painting of the crucifixion, here's the tradition. Jesus was crucified on the spot that Adam and Eve died. That's the skull of Adam and when Jesus' blood drips on it, original sin is forgiven. I don't know. It's an interesting story. Next. Here's a resurrected Jesus who also is not suffering, who looks quite athletic and quite buff. I wish I had a physique like that, right? <laughs> He's in a sarcophagus that is probably from the 1400s or 1500s. Got his foot up there. I'm in control. The guards that passed out, who knows what happened. This Jesus, is in, in, this Jesus is empowered. He's stronger than death. It's a good, clear message. Now, my favorite piece of Christian art is in Germany. It's this next one called the Isenheim Altar, um, painted by a man named Grunwald, I think, in the 1500s. And it's a triptych, meaning those two things on the outside fold so it shuts. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this Jesus was painted for this location because it was a hospital for people who had a skin disease, sort of like leprosy. And if we could zoom in close on it, which I didn't think to do, I'm sorry, Jesus has the same scores on his body. So when those patients in the hospital saw that Jesus, that man is suffering. That man knows what I'm going through. Look at the skin. He's got the same marks on his body that I have. I love this theology. The guy on the right pointing at him, if he's pointing at Jesus, it's always John the Baptist. On the left, you have a woman praying, and she's got a vessel, a flask at her, at her, at her feet. If a woman's carrying a flask in one of these paintings, it's always Mary Magdalene. Okay? There's clues to how these things work. On the left, not as easily identified as Mary swooning and John saving her, rescuing her, comforting her, whatever. Sometimes, and I love these, and I didn't bring one, You'll see a painting like this with all the saints in it, and then there'll be two guys standing in the corner, a man and a woman in the corner, and who are those people? They're not in the Bible. No, they're the ones that paid for the painting. So you, <laughs> it's fun when they show up sometimes. All right, I really like this. And then I really like this painting of resurrection Jesus. And here's what I found out today when I was doing my research on this. It's the same artist. That suffering Jesus... When you close the triptych, next slide, this is what it looks like. There's the resurrected Jesus on the side. And go back one more time to that first image. 
um, I'm sorry, to the resurrected Jesus. Thanks to Brian and Laura. I, I gave them these slides at the last minute today, and I shouldn't do that. Can you see the marks of the nails in his hands? See the guards at the bottom? But he's floating. He's got this red cloth thing around him that almost looks like flames. He's ephemeral. He's, he's, he's not quite there. I like this image of Jesus, too, as opposed to the guy with his foot in the sarcophagus. All right, and I'll wrap up, Jasper. We're almost done, buddy. This gospel ends abruptly. And here's what I noticed when I went through it this time. When you go through Mark's gospel, there's a lot of emphasis on the crowds of people who follow Jesus and sometimes get in his way. The crowds aren't there. They're gone in the story. There's a lot of talk about the Romans who are pressing them, overpowering them, and there's no Romans in this story. And of course, you've got the 12 disciples who follow Jesus the whole time, every day. They're not there. We have three faithful women who've come to the tomb, and when they hear the good news, they run away and don't say anything. Who's left? No one there. I think Mark did that on purpose. The person who's left at that scene is you and me. This is the story. This is what we've been told. Are you going to believe it? Are you going to go to Galilee and search for him or not? I love the way Mark wraps up this gospel. I hope that you were blessed this Easter. I hope that you're blessed in all of your prayers in Christian life and whatever religion or orientation you might have. I respect it and hope that you are enriched by it. Grace to you and peace. Amen. Would you stand with us in body or spirit as you're able? Are you weary? Come, are you thirsty? Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, are you sinners? Come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. So love the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom. Oh
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. We are God's Easter people. May the grace of the risen Christ, the love of God, and the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit bless us so we can be a blessing to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. Praise Him. For the wonders of His love. So 